have a really engaged and lively discussion. Um, first, like Elizabeth, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Munawal people, past and present. I also want to acknowledge with sadness that I, a non-Indigenous person, am standing here representing to talk about Indigenous language rights in Australia. It's a sad state of affairs that we have no Indigenous people in Australia who are speakers of traditional languages who have gone through university to do PhDs. So one of my jobs is to explain a little bit about the background about why that's the case. So before the 1788 invasion, Australia had around 300 languages probably and perhaps as many as 700 different varieties of those languages. Today, from the 2011 census, you can see that the number of Australian Aboriginal people is pretty small compared with the rest of Australia. So in New South Wales, it's about 172,000 people, 2.5% of the state population. Victoria, still smaller, 0.7%. Queensland, South Australia, Western Australia and Northern Territory, those in blue, have got some speakers of traditional indigenous languages. And you can see that the Northern Territory is the only state or territory in Australia where we get up to as much as 26% of the population being indigenous. In 2005, my colleague Patrick McConball here was responsible with others for the National Indigenous Languages Survey Report which interpreted census data, devised an index of language and endangerment, and for a long time has been the main source of Australia-wide information on the status and situation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages. There has been an update more recently, but uh, it's still quite hard to get accurate figures on where languages are spoken. Today, Fewer than 14 of those original 300 or so languages are still spoken by children and they are mostly spoken in remote areas, particularly in the Northern Territory, as I mentioned. The uh, uh, languages with the most hashes um, are the ones which are the strongest languages. In Australia as well, across Australia, many children now grow up speaking new indigenous languages which have resulted from the contact of English with traditional languages. These children very often struggle at school because the way that they speak and the way their families speak is very different from standard Australian English. Our colleague here, Denise Angelo, has described them as invisible learners. They come to school, they're not speaking a traditional Australian language, they speak a variety which has some words of English and the teachers then don't recognise the struggle they are, they are having in understanding standard Australian English. And I'll be very interested to hear from our colleagues as to whether similar situations happen with Spanish and Portuguese in Latin America and in China. In the 2006 census, uh, I've given you here figures of people speaking major indigenous languages, where by major we mean languages with more than a thousand speakers. So you can see we're dealing with tiny numbers of speakers, especially again compared with both China and Latin America. Right down the bottom, you'll see Creole, <coughs> Aboriginal English, Torres Strait Creole, which are some of the names of the new languages. And you can see that the numbers of those are greater than the numbers of the traditional indigenous <coughs> languages, of any of the individual traditional indigenous languages. Um, here you see a, a graph which shows the proportion of speakers of new and traditional languages between 2001 and 2006. And at first glance you think, oh, 2006, you know, the numbers have gone up. But when you break it down, 
you see that what's actually happened is that the number of speakers of new languages, varieties of English, have gone up. The number of speakers of traditional languages has actually gone down. So from 46,748 in the 2001 census, that's the aqua block, to 44,952 in the 2006 census. So there is an effect of demography here, that for the last 20 years at least, and probably earlier, a large proportion of the indigenous population have been language learners, that is, they've been children. So the indigenous population in the remote areas has very high numbers of children and um, very few old people because the, um, the birth rate is high and the mortality rate for older people is also high. Life expectancy is considerably lower than that of non-indigenous Australians. At the same time, many indigenous mothers are young. So many of the, people, the children who were five or 10 years old in 1996 are parents of you know, quite old children now. There's a possible break on language shift if the primary caregiver is the grandmother and a language speaker, but because there is so much ill health, there are far fewer of the older generation left to you know, continue giving input to the children in their traditional languages. So if language, if you have a large proportion of young speakers, then if language shift takes hold among them, the spread to the next generation can be very rapid because women are having children quite young. And language shift is usually not to standard Australian English in these remote communities but rather to Creole or to an Aboriginal English variety, which then makes it hard for young children entering school to understand the language of the classroom, to understand what the teacher is saying to them. So this brings us then to education rights. And there are three really fundamental rights that I think we need to consider. The right to an appropriate education, the right for communities to have a say in how their children are educated, and the right to maintain indigenous languages. These three rights, I think, are intertwined. And they were recognised by the Australian Language Policy in 1987, and also by the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So the right to an appropriate education, you know, children who, are not, who do not speak the dominant language are at a great disadvantage in classrooms where they're taught only in the dominant language. So they need access to the dominant language. Good access to the dominant language is probably best given by mother tongue medium instruction to start with and explicit teaching of the dominant language rather than, as happens all too often now, by immersion in the dominant language without scaffolding via the mother tongue, whether the mother tongue is a traditional language or one of the new Aboriginal English varieties. And the evidence seems to suggest that um, mother tongue medium instruction programs enhance the d learning of the dominant language and in fact in all curricular areas. The second right is the right for the communities to have a say in how their children are educated. That in, in, when we have communities where you know, the older people may never have gone to school or may only have gone to primary school, it's important that they you know, understand what education can do for people. It leads then to increased community support for school if you don't have that community support and community involvement, it's likely to lead to failure in the schools and therefore the children not getting the education that they deserve. <laughs> and if they're not involved, then it's more likely that the children are not going to learn the dominant language and they're not going to learn mainstream subjects. Uh, the final right, the right to maintain indigenous languages, which is protected by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the UNESCO Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity. But language rights 
are only as strong as the implementation of relevant policies. But without that explicit protection in law, Indigenous communities have got no say and no control over government policies for matters that go to the heart of their children's education and for the maintenance of their languages. So and in, if, if, if those rights are not enshrined, then it's all too easy for an education department to say it's much cheaper to teach in the dominant language, so let's ignore uh, the children's rights to learn in their <coughs> own language. Um, so, again, as I mentioned, mother tongue medium education programs have been recognised for a long time as an important part of effective strategies to maintain indigenous languages. So they're good for giving access to the dominant language, for having access to a good education, and also for maintaining indigenous languages. But, again, they're only as good as their implementation. So we have a number of problems. We have students who, as I said, don't know enough English to understand classroom English in standard Australian English. For teachers, we have very few Indigenous teachers and even fewer Indigenous teachers who speak an Indigenous language. There's very little professional development for Indigenous teachers to teach in their first languages. Schools very often don't have specialist teachers trained in teaching the dominant language, English. Then it comes to curriculum and assessment. There hasn't been much support for developing rich curricula, making use of the mother tongue, making use of indigenous languages, and very little support for having this at all levels of schooling. The national assessment, our NAPLAN, is in English, and it takes very little account of the needs of L2 learners. So they're assessed in standard English, and the, uh, their struggles are really not recognised. If you, have, if you have to take a maths test in standard English and you don't speak standard English, you're clearly going to do worse on mat, that maths test than children who do understand the instructions rapidly. And finally, we need more materials. There's not all that much engaging material uh, for children. So games, apps, videos, all the kinds of things that they have access to in English. So, um, I'll leave it there. I've left you, I've given you an overview and I'm leaving you with our problems.